Welcome to the course on Plasma Physics and Applications. In today's module, we'll address issues related to applied superconductivity for fusion. This is not a topic of plasma physics itself, but it is a main enabling technology for fusion uh, energy, that is for one of the main applications of plasma physics. We'll look at the need for superconducting magnets for magnetic fusion, at some few general points on superconductivity, at the requirements and challenges that the employing superconductors for fusion um, imply, and we look at some examples of fusion devices that use superconducting coils today, and more importantly, ITER demo and the uh, steps beyond that, that is the final fusion reactor. We have seen that plasma confinement needs high magnetic fields over large volumes, that is the volume in which the plasma is embedded. Increasing the intensity of the field is key for the performance of magnetic fusion reactors. In fact, the so-called triple product, which I remind you is the product of the density of the plasma times the energy confinement time times the temperature, scales with the power of B, uh, and that power, depending on the assumptions, is in general larger than, than 2. Copper coils can generate large fields, but not in steady state because their current density in steady state is limited to something like about uh, 10 ampere per square millimeters. For steady state, we need superconductors. Superconductors can carry current densities of the order of 1000 amperes per square millimeter. And also, of course, they imply very low dissipation in a coil, and therefore for a reactor, a very important factor, a low recirculating power. Superconductivity was discovered in 1911 by Kamerling Onnes, who observed that the electrical resistance of a sample of mercury became not just small, but exactly zero when the sample was brought at a temperature of a liquid helium. So this is the original plot that uh, um, he produced. You see that below 4.2 degrees Kelvin, the resistance is identically equal to zero. So the open the field of superconductivity. We have no pretension in this course to explain the physics behind superconductivity, but let's just give a very simplistic interpretation of what happens at a microscopic scale. Below a critical temperature, which I refer to as Tc, there's an effective attraction between pairs of electrons, which we call Cooper pairs. And that attraction happens through the lattice and promotes a condensed state in which the phases of all the wave functions are locked together. So contrary to the unpaired or let's say normal electrons which have a, a spin one half, the fermions, the Cooper pairs have integer spin, they, that means they are bosons and therefore they can be in the same quantum state and move resistanceless through the lattice as indicated in the cartoon on the right. Let us briefly discuss the differences between superconductors and perfect conductors. By a perfect conductor we mean a sample that has a zero resistance, therefore that prevents variations of the magnetic field with time or variation with flux through it. So take the sample here, no resistance. Say we start from a situation in which we have uh, no applied field, and then we do apply a field, but the zero resistance on the sample prevents the thin lines from entering into it. So the thin lines we have shape of this kind that we have to go around the sample. Now we remove the field and the sample will stay simply in its state of zero resistance of no field inside. Now if we start from a situation in which the sample is immersed in a field and its uh, resistance is made to zero and then we remove the field, what happens is that the field has to try and stay the same inside the sample to preserve the flux and therefore it will have a shape of this kind. So if we make a sample a perfect conductor in the presence of an externally applied magnetic field, it will try and it will keep its own field inside. In case of a superconductor, the situation is uh, somewhat different. Let's start from the first sequence, so no field to begin with, then we apply a field, and in this case it's uh, similar, identical, 
to what happens in the perfect conductor. That is, the field goes around the superconducting sample and it cannot penetrate inside. Then we remove the field again and we are left with a superconducting sample that has no field inside. So the first case in which we apply a field to a sample and remove it is identical to that of a perfect conductor. What is different is when we uh, apply a magnetic field to a sample that can become superconductor. Say we have a sample that can be superconductor, but it is not superconductor because we are uh, at higher temperature than the critical temperature in which the transition occurs. We apply a field to that. Then we lower the temperature. So the sample becomes superconducting. The field is expelled from the sample. So that's different from what we had in the case of a perfect conductor because the sample does not preserve its state of magnetic field inside but it expels the field. If we then remove the field as in the last step in the previous uh, case, the field is still zero inside the superconductor. So we have positively expelled the field from the area of the superconducting material. That's the so-called Meissner effect. We can now look at the magnetization and the distinction between a type 1 and type 2 superconductors. What happens is that the magnetic flux is excluded from the bulk of the superconducting materials by screening currents that flow at the surface of the material. And that happens within a certain penetration depth, which uh, we call the London penetration depth, or lambda. And the behavior of the superconducting material is determined by the ratio between this penetration depth lambda and the coherence length xi, which is the distance over which typically the superconducting state can change. So let's see the two different cases defining type 1 and type 2 superconductivity. In the first case, we have that the penetration depth is smaller than psi, or more precisely, more smaller than psi is over square root of 2. That's the type 1 case. If in this situation we represent the applied field on the horizontal axis, and the magnetization times the mu naught and times minus 1, so it is minus mu naught m on the vertical axis, we have a behavior of the following kind. We have a perfect compensation of the external field up to a certain value of the field itself, which we call the critical field BC. So this means that the internal field which is equal to B0 plus mu naught m is identical equal to zero for values of the externally applied field that are smaller than the critical value BC. We can represent the situation also in a different uh, representation, which is field versus temperature. We have a curve that defines the state of a superconductivity below a certain value of the temperature, which is a critical temperature Tc, and the certain value of the field, which is the critical value Bc. That's the superconducting state. Outside, we have what we could call a normal behavior. The opposite uh, situation occurs when lambda is larger than psi over square root of 2, and that's what we call the type 2 superconductivity. If I represent the same kind of plot for this situation, I have uh, the following. Here is still the applied magnetic field. Here is still the magnetization times minus mu naught. And the behavior is the uh, same for the first part of the curve. So that means I compensate completely the field 
that I apply outside with the magnetization inside. But that's only true to a certain critical value BC1, which is uh, in general relatively small. And after that, the curve goes down, reaching zero at a certain second critical value BC2. The internal field is zero only for B0 smaller than BC1. But the resistance keeps being zero for values above BC1 up to BC2. So for B0 smaller than BC2. In the B0 versus T representation, what we have is first a region up to TC and up to BC1, which is pure superconducting region, as we had in type 1. But then we have a second region, which is uh, defined by BC2 in terms of uh, magnetic field intensity and still by TC in terms of temperature, which is what we call a mixed state in which you have normal islands whose size is typically psi that are immersed in a sea of superconducting material with zero resistance. So that defines the type 2 superconductivity. Let's now start thinking about using these superconductors for fusion. And the first uh, important point to make is that the values of BC for type 1 superconductors are far too small to prevent their utilization for fusion magnets. So fusion magnets in practice are based only on type 2 superconductors and therefore are in the mixed magnetic state as we have briefly discussed. And in order for the resistance to drop to zero for temperatures below the critical value and for magnetic fields below BC2, we have another limit to, to comply with and that's the current density. The current density must also be below a critical value. So that means we have a defining surface in the J, B and T um, graph that limits the uh, property of superconductors. Let's illustrate that in a plot. Say we have a B in this axis, temperature in the other axis and the current density in the vertical axis. Superconductivity is defined within the surface of a given shape that's limited by the corresponding critical values. So this will be BC, this will be TC, and then we have also a critical value for the current density that we typically call JC. Different materials have slightly different uh, shapes and limitations for this curve. So for example, we can draw a material that has a, a smaller critical surface that would be in green here with its own say BC prime, its own JC prime and its own TC prime. We're now ready to discuss superconducting materials that in practice can be used for fusion magnets. As we say they all of type 2 the first one I can mention is a uh, niobium titanium, which is typically an alloy that's based on something like 44% of titanium in order to maximize the value of uh, the critical field BC2. Its uh, critical temperature is uh, 9.2 Kelvin, and the magnets that we can build out of this material can go up to 8 Tesla. It's a very ductile material that's uh, produced by being co-drawn with copper. And it's produced in large quantities, mostly for medical application in MRIs. Its cost is therefore not that high. It's about 150 to 200 euros per kilogram. Second kind of material that we can uh, use is the niobium trite, which is an intermetallic compound that's created by solid state diffusion of um, tin into niobium. It has a critical temperature of uh, 18 uh, Kelvin. And the magnets we can make out of it can go up to 18 Tesla, which is, of course, very interesting for fusion applications. However, there are a few issues. 
the critical value of the current density strongly decreases under strain. For example, 0.5% of strain is uh, sufficient to decrease that by 30%. And that's not a good uh, piece of news for, for fusion. It's a very brittle material, so it's difficult to wind into coils and has a, a quite a limited production, which amounts to a, a relatively large cost of the order of 600 to 1,000 euros uh, per kilogram. And before completing the family of uh, possible superconductors that are used for fusion, I mentioned the discovery of high temperature superconductivity, which can open up uh, new avenues. The discovery was uh, done by Bernhardt and Müller in 1986, in fact, in, in Switzerland, who discovered that you can have superconductivity at 30 degrees uh, Kelvin. You can see on the plot on the right here uh, the critical temperatures for the different materials as they have evolved throughout the years uh, with a big jump when the high temperature superconductivity was discovered, and therefore you, uh, you can see uh, almost a vertical development here in the first uh, year or first uh, couple of years. Nowadays we have two classes of HTS materials that can be suitable for producing fusion magnets. First class is that made of the bismuth strontium calcium copper oxide compounds or BI2212 or BI2223. Second class is uh, made of a uh, ray earth barium oxide compounds which we refer to generally as a uh, REPCO. The main potential advantage of ATS for fusion <clears throat> is not so much the high value of uh, the critical temperature, but it is the possibility of operating at magnetic fields that are very high, higher than 20 Tesla. So now adding to the list we have uh, made before, we have the new class, HTS, for example, yttrium uh, uh, BCO, which are in the form of ceramic uh, thin films that are on tape, which unfortunately bring uh, anisotropic properties in terms of mechanical uh, aspects, but also in terms of current density. So the design has to take this into account. The critical temperature is uh, very high, 100 degrees uh, Kelvin, but we have to go to low temperature in order to exploit the potential of the high fields. And if we do go to low temperatures, um, this conductor can withstand fields up to 50 Tesla. It's a new technology with so far very limited industrial production and therefore very high cost which is of the order of 12 to 17,000 euros per kilogram. Now looking at the cables for fusion magnets, we have to go from strand to cable and possibly avoiding the degradation of performance as we make that transition. The cables that we use uh, today are mostly made of uh, either niobium titanium or niobium tritin. And they consist of small strands that are formed in turn by very thin filaments of superconducting material, as thin as about 50 microns in diameter, and they are embedded in a copper matrix. Why copper? Copper is needed as the disturbances can occur and can cause a short portion of the superconducting material to become normal, that is non-superconducting. In this sketch, this is illustrated here, so the current would flow in the superconducting material, but if there's a portion of it that's no longer superconducting, the current will flow in the copper section. And that's because the copper section will have a lower resistance than the non-superconducting version of a uh, niobium tin or uh, tritin or niobium titanium. Now, if we're good enough with the heat extraction, if the heat that's generated by this uh, resistive path is evacuated efficiently, then the conductor can go back to superconducting state, and therefore we can have a, a sort of an in situ cure for this uh, local disturbance. And that's why we have copper around. In practice, in fusion magnets, we always use very large cables that carry large currents, not just large current densities, because this allows us to reduce the number of turns, hence the magnetic inductance. ITER, for example, uses a concept called cabling conduct, in which uh, helium flows both in between the strands, in the voids that are left by the strands, and in the central hole uh, in the conductor. As we see immediately, the conduit around, which is made of stainless steel, uh, is there for mechanical stability. So let's discuss the requirements and challenges that making magnets out of superconducting material um, entail. First of all, in terms of mechanical properties. The large fusion magnets that we're building are immersed in very high fields, 
and therefore experience very large electromagnetic loads, essentially all issued fundamentally from the JQRSB force. First of all, there's a force that uh, we refer to as a hoop force or hoop load along the conductor axis. So suppose the magnetic field is produced by a current that goes in this direction. The magnetic field will therefore be in the vertical direction here and coming out of the solenoid in this way. So the hoop force tends to open up uh, the coil and that's proportional to the field intensity to the current and to the radius of curvature. We also have a radial component uh, for the field here at the two ends of the solenoid which produces a, an axial compression of the solenoid in the middle which is a vertical load if you like in this uh, drawing. If we look at the actual uh, toroidal field coil, for example, that of ITER, that's not circular. So why is that important? That is important because if I look at the foot force, which I can represent in, uh, as these uh, vectors here, that's not going to be symmetric be between the inboard and the outboard. The inboard being practically vertical, the hoop force uh, would be uh, very large, the outboard being much more curved, so a smaller radius of curvature will have a smaller hoop force. So there will be a net force that will pull the magnet towards the inboard side. That force will be proportional to the field and the current that flows in a coil. One thing that has to be avoided is the transverse load accumulation from turn to turn in particular, that would be very critical for brittle superconducting materials such as the uh, diamium tritin and the HDS materials that we have in mind for future applications. So that's why we have this uh, conduit around the superconducting cable made of a high modulus material, typically stainless steel, because the cable itself will have a, a low elastic module and therefore will be deformed too much by the accumulation of this uh, stress. In fact, as a consequence, most of the volume of the fusion magnets actually consists of uh, stainless steel. Let's look at the thermal requirements and challenges. The large mass of the superconducting magnets must be kept very cold in a cryostat that uses very large helium refrigerators. Typically, we use a few tens of megawatts of electrical power to remove heat loads over several tens of kilowatt at low temperature. This is an example of the, of the cryo uh, building or the cryo system in ITER, which has a cooling power of 75 kilowatts at 4.5 uh, Kelvin for the helium circuit and uh, 1.3 megawatts at 80 Kelvin for the liquid nitrogen circuit. Liquid nitrogen is in blue here, the helium um, is in orange and the cryo lines that go to the cryostat and then the tokamak are in uh, green. What are the main heat loads? We have the nuclear radiation on the TF coils that's generated by the neutrons that are issued by the fusion reactions in the core of the plasma. We have some ohmic heating at the conductor joints, which are not perfect conductors. Heat conduction through the feeders and gravity supports. AC losses in the coils. And we have uh, pumping losses for the circulation of the helium in the system. And finally, we have some heat radiation from the room temperature components. We notice that the variation of the operating temperature must be kept within the margin of one, maximum two degrees uh, Kelvin. We also note that uh, even for high temperature superconductors, we need to be cooled uh, below 10 to 20 K to withstand high fields and to have uh, good current densities. Challenges are also posed by the electrical aspects of uh, the magnets. In particular, in case of quench, which is uh, the term we use to define a local irreversible loss of superconductivity, we must discharge the superconducting magnets very quickly. 
and dump the large store energy that's in them in external resistors, therefore preventing the damage by high temperature spots in the windings. So what are the challenges to, of doing that? We have to have a 100% reliable fast quench detection system. We have to have fast current break, uh, breakers that can withstand high voltage and high currents. So this is the breaker that would uh, open the circuit if we have a quench. So a portion of the superconductor that is no longer superconducting, we have to have the current that go through and uh, is dissipated by this resistor. So we have to open that uh, uh, breaker very quickly. And of course, we have to have high voltage isolation for uh, both the feeders and the, the windings. In fusion magnets, the electrical isolation consists of a glass cutting wraps that are impregnated by epoxy. This may sound like a, a relatively easy detail, but in fact, the quality of the impregnation is very crucial for the mechanical integrity of the coils and is very important to prevent electrical discharges or flashovers to ground during the phase of the fast discharge of the coil itself. Last but not least, there are economical challenges for the coils. The cost of the materials that we use for superconducting coils is about 100 to 1,000 times that of copper. As a consequence, the superconducting magnets make up a very substantial fraction of the total cost for a large fusion device. For example, in this uh, pie from uh, ITER, you can see the different aspects and the different components um, that are represented in terms of the fraction of the total cost. And the conductors for the superconducting magnets are here, niobium tin, niobium uh, titanium, and the other elements for the coil structures, uh, for example, are all here, amounting in total to about 30% of the capital cost. So that means that the uh, cost-effective design and manufacture for these magnets are absolute crucial issues. Just to show pictorially that we are already using several fusion devices that uh, employ superconducting coils, here are the pictures of some of them, starting from uh, the uh, one built in 1977 at Korchatov in Russia, it goes up to 5 Tesla with neobium titanium coils, um, with the most recent uh, West facility at CEA, it's a new version of a Tor Supra in France, uh, that employs also neobium titanium uh, going up to uh, 9 Tesla and uh, several other examples in the in the east, the K-Star uh, in Korea, east in China. And uh, the uh, superconducting stellarator here, it goes up to se uh, 6 Tesla, also using a uh, neobium titanium and the force flow for, for helium. Now let's look at what's being built for ITER. In fact, that's the largest magnet system ever built. We see different uh, components here, the TF coils, the toroidal field coils, made of a uh, niobium uh, tritin, going up to 11.8 tesla, the central solenoid for driving the ohmic current into the plasma, also niobium tritin, up to 13 tesla, the poloidal coils, which uh, don't require such a high field and therefore can uh, be made of uh, niobium titanium, as the correction coils, uh, which only need to go up to 4.2 tesla, also made of uh, niobium titanium. In total, we have a uh, 48 superconducting coils uh, mounting when they operated to a total store energy of more than 50 gigajoule, which is a gigantic number. They're all cooled with a supercritical helium at 4 Kelvin. And just to give you an idea of the challenge, uh, this is the largest single procurement for uh, neobium treating superconducting material. And the strand for the TF coils and the central solenoid together correspond to a weight of about 500 tons and to a length of about 100,000 kilometers. As we have uh, discussed in other lectures, ITER will demonstrate that fusion can be uh, done scientifically and technologically on Earth, but we need one other step to demonstrate that we can also have an economical development of uh, fusion energy, and that's uh, referred to as DEMO. And while ITER is being built, several DEMO devices or approaches are proposed throughout the world. There's a broad range of approaches, in fact, from very high field tokamak, which is much more compact than ITER, to tokamaks that are somewhat a slightly larger version than ITER. Here on the left, you see an example of the high field compact uh, proposals. This is the ARC proposal from uh, MIT in the US. 
and that employs high temperature superconducting coils with a peak field up to 23 uh, tesla. So you can see the size is relatively small compared to the other proposal that I illustrate here, which is the uh, European demo proposal. 9 meters of major radius as opposed to 3, and the peak field of 12 tesla. This is uh, using a low temperature niobium tritin uh, superconducting um, coils. All of these proposals around the world, all of the possible ideas and approaches for the step after ITER use superconducting magnets. In summary, we have seen that superconducting magnets are a main element of enabling technology for fusion reactor developments. ITER and all the future fusion devices we have in mind set new technical challenges that are very demanding for superconductors. A main element for uh, the development of a power plant based on the magnetic fusion concept is the optimization of the cost to performance ratio of the magnets, that is the cost divided by the magnetic field intensity that can be produced over the large volume, and that's the main driver for design and manufacture of the magnets and of the reactor. New avenues for high field compact magnetic fusion reactors can be opened by the application of high temperature superconductivity.